I'd like to start, uh, and this is a kind of a loose format, is basically ask each of you the same question and get it rolling. And then I have a bunch of questions and then we'll see where it goes from there. Having done this before, it's been very, very, uh, it's kind of great for me as a filmmaker to get to know other filmmakers and to hear them see their work and then hear them talk about it. So let's just start physically this way. Tara, how did you get involved in your project? One that no one else here is familiar with, huh? Yeah. Lesson in chemistry, oh, three shy. directors here. Um, I really fought for this job, actually. Um, Bert and Birdie, who uh, also directed on this show, who did a fantastic job. They got a very hard block with dogs and babies, and they should get all the awards. Um, uh, Bert mentioned she was coming onto the show. And then Hanalee Culpepper, another director, said, oh, D-Block is open. I just had to turn it down because I had a conflict. And I was like, get me that job. And so I really circled the wagons. Um, I was in Australia on another show. My AD's wife happened to say, oh, you should really read this book and put lessons in chemistry down in front of me. And I sent it to my agents. And I was like, you guys, it's a sign. And uh, Lee Eisenberg, I've known for a long time. And I was subtly bothering everyone around him and not <laughs> bothering him. Um, yeah. and and. Uh, my team really helped me kind of circle in on it, but was very, very thrilled to get this job, honestly. It's cool. like a big step for me. It was like, I've only done one other streaming show for Apple, Little America. Um, so yeah, I was very excited. If I'm a good guesser, this won't be your last. <laughs> Millicent. Well, I did not know Lee Eisenberg and I had not read the book Lessons in Chemistry. <laughs> and, um, it was my, Michael Costigan came to my managers, and he's uh, one of the heads over at Aggregate, who are the producers for Lessons in Chemistry, and they brought it to my attention. I have 16-year-old twins, and I have basically been on the road for 15 years of their life. So I had put a mandate down that I was going to work in Los Angeles because my kids are getting older, and I had to be around. And this was a show in LA. And when I um, read the scripts, I instantly fell in love with them. And then I interviewed, did a Zoom interview um, with Lee. And, you know, it's incredible that there are, there are so many female directors up here because one of the things that I really identified with um, Elizabeth was, you know, being a female in a predominantly male industry and figuring out my place and my way and my voice. And so it's so amazing that you know, the fruits of our labor in this predominantly male uh, oriented industry has evolved and you have, you see four women up here being nominated by the Directors Guild. So that was fabulous. But Lessons in Chemistry was a really great experience. Cool. Cool. It's, before I answer the actual question, I just want to say it's really fucking cool to be up here with everybody. <laughs> it's really meaningful. It's so, I mean, um, yeah, Lessons in Chemistry was a, a, a wonderful experience, and it came to me through um, Louise Shore, who's one of the EPs who I've worked with before. We did a movie together, and it kind of came my way fast and furious and sort of like, a, we need you, but like right now situation. Um, and so I think I like sped read the book um, in 24 hours, and then it was like talking with Brie as she was like on a train from one European country to the next. I don't remember where she was. And, um, and, and yeah, just, um, you know, on all kinds of zooms, but it was all, I feel like from the time I got the call to like 48 hours later, I was like basically working on it. Um, yeah. And it, it, uh, turned out to be, I, I didn't, I don't think I knew this getting in, but it really turned out to be one of the most joyful work experiences I've ever had. It was really, um, really fantastic, like top-notch crew, top-notch cast. And I just have, yeah, such respect for everybody's, everybody's contributions and such an honor to be up here with you guys. Thank you. And Zynga, Daisy Jones. Well, um, it's funny you said it was the most joyful experience you had and everybody else was nodding. I wonder when it gets to him if that's a part of why people gravitated toward the work is I felt that way with Daisy as well. Like it was a singular experience and, but I'll answer your question. I was just curious for what she said. Um, I was on set with Lauren Neustadter from Hello Sunshine and I'd done something with them before. And she said, what do you have coming up next? And I was like, well, I'm up for this pilot. And she was like, I have something better. And I was like, you don't even know what it is. <laughs> and I was like, well, I don't know. And she was like, I know what you're thinking. Cause I was really like, I like world building. And she was like, you can have your own first AD who's here tonight. 
You can have an Anna Notarita's DJ, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> you can bring your own DP with you. And our showrunner sees it as two separate movies. So this is the beginning of a new movie. And I was very excited by that. And I was like, well, who's the showrunner? It was her husband, <laughs> but who was one of my favorite writers, Scott Neustadter, who wrote 500 Days of Summer. So I was like, yes, I'm in. And, uh, and, and then we did it. So uh, apropos of what you said, we'll get to Sean in one second. Uh, we're doing the 40th ver year ver anniversary of Risky Business on Criterion. And Rebecca de Mornay, who was in the movie, was asked by someone why uh, she felt that the film may have lasted and been, been a good film. And she said, everyone had the same dream. And I think that's sort of what you're saying here. Sean, all the light. I do, I, I do want to touch on that idea and that kind of joyousness, just because I remember when, when I first got into the DGA, the first sense, I remember this so clearly that the moment I felt I'd arrived was when I could go to a Meet the Nominees event. <laughs> I thought that was so cool to get to go to that building and listen to other people who loved the job and were doing the job. And um, and I, I, I share that kind of uh, thrill at this moment as a result. Um, I guess for me, it was a, a, a little bit of a different road just because I had come up doing um, television episodes early in my career. And um, I've done mostly movies for the last, um, I don't know, 15 years. But I read All the Light We Cannot See when it came out and I loved it. But someone else had optioned it to do it as a movie. And I just kind of kept my eye on it. And I found out maybe three years ago that they couldn't cram that novel into two hours. And so through a lot of just kind of hustle and um, probably being a nuisance, I got on the phone with the novelist and I said, um, I think that we shouldn't try and shrink it to fit a certain form. Let's let the story dictate the form. And maybe it's four episodes, maybe it's six. And so I got the rights to the book and I knew I was going to um, produce it. Uh, and I thought maybe I would direct an episode um, but then I read Stephen Knight's adaptation. He ended up doing all the episodes. And I read the first draft of the first episode. And I was like, no, no, I, I want to do all of this. And um, and so I ended up directing all of the episodes of All the Light, um, which ended up being about four and a half hours long and uh, spent a year doing that and uh, did it with such gratitude and joy at bringing this story that I loved on the page uh, to life on the screen. So let me uh, drill down a little bit here. So the Anthony Doerr's book was a very internal piece. I mean, I remember when I read it, I was like, whoa. And, and I think Scott Rudin uh, optioned it, if I remember correctly. And so how did you approach that? I mean, you had Stephen's script and how did you deal with that? And how did it come out both in terms of the adaptation and how you as a director filmed it? What was your approach on that? You, you know, it, it, you're completely right. And that was my, that's, I was daunted for that reason. But for me, my way in on this was the protagonist is this French girl who's blind. And, um, and I decided as I started early prep that I wanted to cast it that way. And so we did this global search and we found these two girls, one who was seven named Nell Sutton and one who was in her early twenties named Aria Liberty, who are themselves blind and had never acted and had never even auditioned. Um, in fact, Aria, who really is the lead, is a PhD candidate in rhetoric. And the, the kind of internal nature of the book, that was a dominant idea. But what was more, what superseded that for me was working with these two girls and young women and just trying to do right by the way they navigate and experience the world. And um, and so that was interesting to work in our medium, which is visual, telling a story about a heroine who experiences the world non-visually. And so it just got me thinking about touch, texture, sound design, um, rhythm, uh, proximity, the way people interact with space in a way that was very different than I've ever experienced 
as a director. And that was that was kind of what unlocked it for me and became my my way in. Cool. Uh, we'll come back to sound because that's something I want to speak to everybody here about. And it's interesting in yours. And Zynga, you got the project, right? And then what was your, you know, what were you looking at in terms of the themes and in terms of how you visualize and how you brought them to life? Um, well, I, I had heard a lot about the book. I intentionally didn't really dig deep into it because I had just come off something else that was a book and kept getting confused, like between what was in the script and what was in the book. Um, but I had heard like, well, it's kind of like about a fictional Fleetwood Mac. And I didn't have those cultural touchstones of like, I knew everything about Fleetwood Mac. So if it was Bobby and Whitney, I would be like, I know exactly what that's about. <laughs> and so I just was like, what's this about for me? And it was really, and that's why I used that clip actually, is it, it really was a show about grace and like them showing each other grace and like, in that moment, which goes on a little, every single one of those characters does something that is painful for themselves, like her telling him to go, but is an act of grace towards the other person. And so every scene, I would just write the word grace on it and like think about like how that manifests that in that scene or like, is it an argument against it? Or should you protect yourself? And so it was something that I always had that I could talk to our actors about and give them something they could anchor it in. Um, a lot of the other things, I come from music videos, and so I, I knew how to shoot music, and I felt like that was the um, that was just the the way that I could get into it and feel like okay, this feels big, but I can do it. I know how to shoot music, like that's a good freebie, and um, and yeah, and just coming back to what I thought the show really wanted to say every single time with the actors, with the showrunner, like anchoring it in that I felt like made it mine. Cool. Sarah. So when, uh, I just got so lost in her answer that I forgot what the, what the question was. The themes you wanted to explore. Uh, well, and how um, you visualize them because yeah. you did very definite choices. I like them. Thank you. I, I felt, um, my two episodes, the first and second episode, felt like their own um, little movie uh, in a way. And almost like the first two episodes are kind of, <laughs> not to spoil it, but like the end of second episode is kind of like the inciting incident in a way for the rest of the series. And so I, I, really, I was really interested in um, how to... Um, how to show how to capture chemistry on screen, um, particularly like the chemistry of two people falling in love before our eyes, um, and really uh, um, wanted to make all of my choices in service to that, um, and uh, felt also that it was about um, creating maximum emotional contrast, uh, if that makes sense, so that. Again, I'm, I guess I'm spoiling things, but like I wanted us to love so deeply and love them so deeply so that we are also hurt um, when that love um, vanishes or changes and changes changes form later on in the series. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of a lot of my choices were really just like how to um, create the space for um, these these performances to be um, so open and, and so vulnerable that we feel like we're actually spying on them um, and spying on this love story in motion and then very much doing it with the whole season in, in mind, thinking about how do I set up um, uh, the rest of the story to come and create the, the most heartbreak and contrast um, that then will be carried on by the rest of the episode. Okay, so I'm going to dig a little deeper, if you will, allow me. Uh, so the opening shot or shots, you know, are very distinctive. Uh, and when you use the word spy, it's an interesting choice of words. So how would how'd that come to you and what were you thinking? Uh, because I thought it was very effective. Um, for the opening shot of the first episode, what I, what I wanted to do was create um, a suspense and a mythology behind this character. And again, was looking for maximum contrast, thinking about, okay, so here's this woman who's this TV star and this celebrity, knowing that we're going to then 
the hard cut is to then her like, you know, serving s coffee to other scientists as a lab tech and like cleaning up broken beakers. So I was really just thinking about how do we um, infuse um, this character we're about to meet with um, the most amount of um, power and intrigue. And she's really like the center of this this she's a force and she's a center of this world that she's created. So I wanted to um, sort of suspend the moment that we meet her and make us like really hungry to meet her so that when we finally do, she has even more kind of power. And then and then we cut to, you know, she's a woman with no power at all. She's a brilliant chemist and no one will take her seriously. And she's, you know, cleaning up other people's messes. Cool. Is If you haven't seen it, watch it. Watch all these episodes. Anyway, Millicent themes visualizing them you've been doing this a little while you know what you're doing so he keeps calling me old hmm. <laughs> did, did that word come out of my mouth hmm. it's between the lines but it's okay <laughs> what but the themes that i did um pull out of it my two episodes were actually quite different um the first one was really the first time that you really explore elizabeth doing her show so it's a step into uh, the beginning of her show, um, Supper After Six. And we we spent time, uh, myself and the DP, really thinking about, you know, how do we make the show a character? And every time that she's in the the show, what is it, how does it play into the scene and her character? And feeling like every time we approach it, it's a different way to approach it. So I must have spent, I know we shot for a week inside of that, damn that place and by the end I thought I was losing my mind but um when it cut together it all felt, felt fresh and new but for us I was like oh my god if I have to be in this space one more time but it was a really a, a test to see you know how can you visually um tell a story in the same space over and over and over again and keep it fresh and and that was a challenge that I, f I find, you know, at, at this stage in the game, I find um, whenever I get a challenge to do something, I, I really, um, really love it and, and get into it. And it excites me about a project. My second episode was very vastly different. Um, if you haven't seen the show, Elizabeth is um, a very strong willed, smart woman who has been reduced. Mm -hmm. Her intelligence and uh, for being a chemist has been reduced and she ends up um being this amazing um, celebrity on a cooking show, but which is not what her passion is. Her passion is for food, but really her, her main love is chemistry. And she was put in a situation where she's trying to capitalize off of it and she uh, has this daughter. And a lot of people don't understand her. Most people don't understand her. And she's very prickly. And my episode uh, gives flashbacks to her as a child. And it gives you a lot of the understanding of what created this woman. And that's juxtaposed with in the current time, which the scene um, calls notice to, is her neighbor. She lives in a black neighborhood and her neighbor was dealing with a lot of the civil rights issues of the moment. And um, very smartly, this episode draws um, a, a comparison between the women's movement and the civil rights movement. And really it's a movement to be seen as an equal and have your ability and your voice heard and be respected on an equal level. And it's about respect. And so when we went into, there's several scenes that lean up to the one that you saw. Uh, there was no actual visual reference to, this was based on a real experience, but there was no, surprisingly, there was no visual reference to this, this uh, protest. And the historian couldn't find anything about it. I mean, we read some information about it, but there were no visuals. And so it's interesting when, when Sean was saying, you know, giving visuals to something, it's like we had to figure out what the visuals would be. And so we did a lot of uh, searching through the historical documents on what was really happening in the civil rights movement. And then um, we placed it in underneath this underpass or overpass or whatever you want to call it. And really my intent was to um, put you into the, the the characters and that this wasn't just a protest. It was about these characters and their individual emotions and feelings. And so the whole situation around it was 
kind of less of what I was, I was looking for. I wanted to be true. And we said, um, if we were going to do this moment of black pain that we were going to, and, and really just pain, we were going to make it hurt. And otherwise there's no reason for it. And it's interesting enough is that, um, during the post process, there was a huge discussion by the studio to cut the scene. And, um, I was in a bad mood when they called and <laughs> I told them the truth. And I said, you know, uh, one of the reasons why you know, this is the same time that DeSantos was trying to, you know, change the history. Uh, and I said, one of the reasons why this, something like this happens over and over again is because as filmmakers, we haven't been honest about what really happened. I said, you know, you do a lot of, you see a lot of stories about the Holocaust and you see how brutal and how painful it was. And, there is a reason for that so that it will never happen again. And when we do things about black pain and we do things about civil rights, it needs to be just as brutal and just as painful and just as truthfully representative of what really happened during that time so that people understand and it never happens again. So that's really what was at the heart of why we did this. Thank you. Uh, forgive me, but Millicent and I work together a lot in the guild. So if I'm too twyay, if I'm familiar with her or she's familiar with me, that's where it's coming from. And Tara as well. So take your whack at it and maybe look a little bit at, you know, the design, the production design and the color scheme, and, you know, how that factors into the visualization. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I had the last two episodes of, of lessons and certainly, um, came in with a lot already designed the, um, the homes, the set, Sarah had kind of laid all that out. Um, and, uh, Millicent had come before me and our, our keys, I have to say, were absolutely incredible. Everybody was, uh, brought their a game to this. And it was really wonderful to come into a world where everybody was, uh, the level was just such high, you know, uh, just a high standard of work. Um, uh, there was a lot of debate in, uh, in my episodes about how much Christmas was too much Christmas. Um, you know, because the way that this show sort of unfolded, and I think all of us probably came in with scripts still being written, which wasn't ideal, but put me in a really beautiful position to be able to collaborate with the writers. Um, and I felt very lucky to, you know, um, you know, these are just little production things, but we didn't have the money to go to the Christmas tree farm to have them pick a Christmas tree. So instead they're decorating the tree at the house. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, we have this whole thing with this chain at the end. Why don't they make one of the chains that I've made with my kids? And then that can go at the end and they can be passing that around. And so that was like, you know, some of it feels more mine than a normal show might. Um, even I thought it was very, very important that Elizabeth not just be a teacher at the end. I felt like there's so many women who we struggle to do the job that we want to do. And when we can't do that, we're relegated to teach other people how to do it. And so it was important to me that we had the sense that Elizabeth was going to go on to be a chemist, that she was going back to school to finish what she started. Um, and I fought for that really hard in the writer's room. So um, in terms of building the world, um, I definitely got to build the orphanage, the kids orphanage. And, um, that was really fun hopping back into the 1920s. My grandfather was an orphan in New York city. And so I, it, there was like something really special about, uh, exploring that with all those boys and in that space and that Catholic orphanage. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so funny, like how much of yourself, you know, just coming into a couple of episodes on a television show, you, you bring. Um, and then the only other thing I've, I've said this before, but Sarah's Elizabeth, uh, was very different than my Elizabeth. I got an Elizabeth who had come through so much suffering and so much learning and thought she had, she, she sort of had figured it out to some extent. Um, and then it was my job to sort of uproot her again and, um, uh, create something that felt more connected and, and a little bit more lyrical, more tactile and more sensory for her. And so I think that's uh, reflected in a lot of my camera work and a lot of the shot choices and how we filmed the cooking very differently than Sarah did in the beginning and even differently than Millicent did in, in her episodes. Well, one thing I think probably is universal is how personal you make this, your work here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people would say, well, episodic, you know, you're given a script. No. And Sarah, if I may share something you said about taking advantage, I'll just keep it more general, uh, taking advantage of what's thrown at you, you know, when you come in, in the early part of an episode, and instead of going, oh, God, this sucks, you just ran with it, and they had to catch up with you. Correct? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Let me go to Sean. 
and 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 go, go to sound and mix because you you mentioned you know that and I wanted to hit on that and then come back around. Uh, I'll be I'll be I'll be as concise as I can, but I really think it's interesting what what you just touched on because it is such a thing about directing, especially television directing. This presumption that like oh you get the script you shoot the words, but no one who takes pride in the work considers that the job. The job is to do that, but the job is how am I going to take what flows in me and flow it into and through and underneath the words. And I, I feel like every answer you you got just there, John, touches on that. And it's what makes the, it's back to where we started, right? That's what makes the job joyous is you get to try, if, if we're lucky, we flow some of our own DNA and the ideas that captivate us and the feelings that animate us into the thing we're directing. So I just, it's my personal favorite aspect of the job and I think it applies to good television as much as it applies to a movie or any other form. Um, sound wise, I just, in my first meeting with, as I said, this was one where I knew I would have to be a guide for Aria because she'd never auditioned or acted before. But, I, but wasn't she also a guide for you too? This is my point. From our very first, we, we I mean, she read over Zoom. She did her callbacks over Zoom. She got the part over Zoom. But then we met in person. And I, I from that moment on, I realized, oh man, all my ideas about this experience of being unsighted, it's based on a hundred years of a certain kind of representation of blindness. It's not the thing. It's not the real thing. And I watched how Aria would use the back of her fingertips much more than the front of her fingertips. And I would ask her about why that is. And I learned about kind of the sensitivity of different kinds of touch and the way that Aria interacted. And so when it led to, just to try and give you an answer to the question you actually asked, um, I said, well, as far as production design, what would this character have in the room? And Aria being a, a book nerd in the greatest possible way, she knew all the things in the book that those of us who love the book knew, the seashells, the pine cones, the radio, et cetera. But she also said the things I would pick for a windowsill would not be based on what they look like. They would be based on what sound do they make when a breeze comes through. And so from that first conversation, it it just kind of became a North Star for production design, for sound design, um, and certainly for me, thinking about the sound that things make and the way that they feel beyond and maybe even more so than the way that they look. And so sound design became informed by a heightened sense of hearing in the absence of vision. And so that, that just uh, applied to the production design all the way through the final mix and how we balance the different soundscapes. But that also the heightened sense of design of sound also applied to the absence of sound, which I thought you used very skillfully. Well, I think that I forgive me uh, this. I'm for some reason, I can't make all of you in the theater bigger. Um, but, uh, but I do look forward to meeting you all Saturday. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was that sequence where it's the countdown and the idea is that the villain Von Rumpel willfully deafens her because he knows that then she'll be truly helpless for maybe long enough for him to come in and kill her. And uh, and so where we hear things in a heightened way was every day an interesting topic, but where we take it away and what is left when that is diminished. Um, yeah, uh, that was very much the kind of toggling that we explored. And this is a sound designer and a sound team and an editorial team that I've worked with for almost 20 years. And they came to this, again, we spend most of our time doing movies and they came to this because I asked them to join me, just like my AD staff did and all these longtime collaborators. And we all just got really excited by this new way of thinking about storytelling that was unique to this character and this story. Thank you. Uh, just as an aside, uh, I did a film about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising about the Holocaust, as Millicent said, and it was rough, exactly as Millicent said. Uh, and the moment when our protagonists are being taken to the trains, it was a pretty gruesome moment. And I elected to pull all the sound out for about 30 seconds, 
And I thought it was very, very effective because how do you amplify this? How do you, if you try and make it bigger, you know, and that, that's why I thought it was so effective, you know, in some of the locations down by the water, when you're hearing the water lapping, all of a sudden you as an audience are being more sensitized. And then when you pulled it out in that very climactic sequence, you know, again, it, to me as an audience, it made me lean in. So bravo. Ah, you're not getting away, girl. All right. Okay. You've got a lot of experience. Oh, I know you're not going to walk away from anything. You have a lot of experience doing music videos, yeah. you know, and, you know, one of the challenges it seemed to me in looking at the whole piece was that each time you're doing a number, I think it has to mean something. Yeah. It has to have a narrative purpose. For sure. And, and oh, sorry. No. Uh, well, I was going to say for sure. And one of the things like I, of course, did my research once I had the job on Fleetwood Mac and like what the dynamic was and all of those songs on that first album, they were singing to each other. And so it was easy to sort of find the subtext. And like the, the challenge was because of music videos where you're selling a look and a style and you're just saying like, this person's cool. <laughs> like that's what you should walk away with. Um I had to always be thinking about like, what's the subtext driving this? Like we, we did something that looks cool, <laughs> like, but like what's really driving every scene. And it was the singing scenes were like some of my favorites because there's no dialogue and there's so much story. And so often I remind actors like uh, an absence of words is not an absence of meaning. Like it's just an absence of words, like use your silence. The songs made them not ad lib and do all this stuff. Like it just made them like, what am I saying to this human being? Which is what I'm always trying to get actors to remember in shooting. Well, it seemed very specific to me in that last song, you know, what you were trying to say with four of the characters at minimum. I mean, that was clearly conscious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I thought it was yeah, also. It was always just remember what this is about. Like, cause it sometimes, even I sometimes like those songs were good. Yeah. And so you get lost in them and you get lost in the joy of just playing and like singing. And so I'd have to go in and remind them, like, that's not what you're saying to him though. Like, did, did, did you do the dub of, of that, of that, of the show of the episode? Yeah. So did you do anything different in it? Uh, or was it still playing just as you would normally see it? Because again, to me as an audience, yeah. it was very clear what you were trying to get across and it was very affecting. No, it was not. It, it really was a very, my first idea is here. I was about to say it was simple and she's probably like, girl. <laughs> <laughs> we had every Bible plague <laughs> and a bomb threat. <laughs> so wow. They worked it out. <laughs> so, um, but the actual like on stage dealing with the music was really simple. It was just, they had it like that. I, I didn't interfere with them too much. It was just, just remember what you're really saying and what's really going on. And don't like when, it, when we're having too much fun on, especially in that concert, like I had to stop it for one second because the joy of performing took over. And I was like, this is like, a sacrifice that this man is making. Like, this is a very painful moment. Yeah. <laughs> like we have to like get, just get back to it. And yeah. Well, I want to get back to grace when we come around one more time. Okay. okay. But thank you. All right, Sarah, you got there, you started off there, you had the look, you know, and it was very, very specific, very unusual and may have feel like it's in the ether, have some relationship to Barbie in some way. You know, only because of the popping of the colors, you know. And again, it's a little bit, just a little bit, Millicent, before my time. I'm much older than <laughs> Millicent. Uh, you know, it, talk about that process, how it came about. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, Elizabeth as a character, she wants to be a chemist. No one will take her seriously as a chemist. And then she gets this left field opportunity to come um, um, you know, host a cooking show and the people who designed that set for her were designing it to be like, well, what would be the ideal kitchen that any woman would want? And of course it would be 
bright pink. <laughs> so it was also, you know, um, Brie Larson, who stars in the show, was also an EP um, on the show and like a really um, wonderful creative contribution. And and um, she was talking to Kat Smith, the production designer, and we were all talking about like, well, what would be what would be the sort of the most offensive kitchen in a way for her um for her to walk into um ironically and this is not connected it just like maybe it was kismet or something i have a pink kitchen at home i've seen that's it. almost it's as really bright pink. as this and it just like that was just coincidence uh millicent i'm not gonna look at you and i'm not gonna say it. <laughs> uh talk a little bit about performance you know you're working with brie she's a you know, she's a formidable Academy Award winner. You know, a few of us have been there. What was it like um, creating the chemist? It it actually was great. Uh, uh, as Sarah said, you know, Brie was a really great collaborator. Um, and for me, I like actors who come with a lot of questions and who are really smart. And she is the epitome of that. Uh, she is very in tune with her character. She has done her homework. And... Um, she will ask you questions and expect the answers and not just the answer that you think she wants to hear, but she wants the truth. Mm -hmm. And I respect that. And that's how I operate. So um, we would always approach scenes and try to find what is the real truth. And then we would uh, always play a little bit. Once we got one or two takes underneath our belt, then I'd say, well, what about, because I try to, when I direct is to, I know what the words are. But when I go on set, I don't really pay attention to what the words are. I try to watch the performance and I'm always cued into uh, what is the heart of the character and what feels real. And I start to hear things differently when I do that and not you know, really look at what the words are. And so certain things would hit me and I would say, well, what about this? You know, this just made me think about what's going to happen to you here. So what if you play it like this? And she'd say, OK. And we try it. And sometimes it was really great. And then sometimes it would suck, you know, and I'd go, yeah, that sucks. She's like, yeah, we're not going to do that again. But we got to really, I love that the fact that she was open to playing and to experiment uh, with the character. Uh, I also had the opportunity to, to really work with Alice who um, played the daughter and she was very, very uh, young, a young actress. And, she was just the brightest, most wonderful human being I ever had to work with. I mean, it's like, you know, kids and dogs and we had kids and dogs. And Alice was amazing. And Brie and Alice just had the best relationship. And someone asked me, they were like, how do you direct kids? And I was like, I direct kids the same way I direct adults. I talk to them the same way. I don't, I don't like to dumb down conversations um, to, to child actors and Thank God Alice was is is one of the smartest, brightest children I've ever met on the planet Earth. So I could talk to her about story and character and and she would think about it and come back and have a thought and we'd work on that and we would I would give her notes about why don't you adjust this? There's one lovely scene in this episode towards the end where she and Bree are sitting together and um they're talking about uh Bree's character is talking about how her daughter um has helped her open up about the, the loss of the daughter's father, which we learn, mm -hmm. and and how she she's never really talked about it, but she finally opened up. And so we did the wide shot, and then I did Bree's coverage, and Bree was crying. And <laughs> you can see Alice look at her. And then Alice came to me when we were setting up for Alice's side, and Alice said, Bree was really acting, and she was crying. She said, I want to cry too. <laughs> <laughs> and what we talked about, I was like, you can't just cry. It has to mean something. It has to come out of story and character. And it was wonderful to watch these two actresses, one very experienced, one very new, but they were both feeding off of each other and doing the dance together. And it was just fabulous. Um, and then in the scene that you guys just saw, um, Asia, who um, was really pivotal in this storyline, um, you know, she really gave her all and it's hard. I mean, it's hard to be very vulnerable. She's a very strong, um, kind of introverted actress and um, very protective of her emotions. And we talked about who this woman was that she was portraying. And in this given moment, what was she feeling? And um, Asia was really willing to 
open up and express her vulnerability, but do it through strength. You know, I mean, that was the whole thing is that they didn't want to ba- they didn't want to boo hoo, but the cracking was happening underneath the surface. And I think sometimes that's much more interesting to just see somebody like crying. It's the fighting against the crying. It's what's underneath it. And so not only with these three characters, but with um, so many other of these actors, we had such an amazing cra- cast. We really just, I always approach it through story and character and try to find, build depth um, into all the characters and find things that aren't written on the page for the actors to play. And, the moments between the lines. Yeah. Tara. Hi. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> what were we taught? What was the question now? I think it's evolved. It was no, now. the question for you is going to be a little different. Brand new. Okay, great. I'm ready. How do you prepare? Um, you do shot list, you do storyboards, what's your uh, process? Yeah, so I, um, how do I prepare? I definitely do shot lists. Um, I try to spend as much time in the space as possible. Just like, I want to ask a couple questions. When you do the shot list, is it disseminated to the uh, key people? No. So it's for you. As much as they would like it right. to be, yeah. Okay. I And there's been a couple of times where people have really, really pushed and I've been like, it's okay, like just the AD and the DP can have it. Um but things evolve so quickly and I just don't want to be in this position where somebody's like, Oh, I heard we're going home in a half an hour. And I'm like, no, you guys, it didn't work. Like whatever we were planning, it's different. You know, I just think it's like, um, it, it just doesn't work that way for me, unfortunately. And things, especially when you've gotten the script, you know, several days before shooting and everything's evolving and I'm working on weekends and who knows, who knows what it's going to be, uh, by five o'clock. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I spend a lot of time shot listing. Um, I try to meet with every single actor before I start shooting and have conversations with them about any concerns they have about like what we're looking to do in the script. Um, I find that to be one of the most important things that a, on a, you know, as a journey episodic director, you have to really push for, um, what else? I, I you, do you were also- books. I'll like pull images. I'll pull music. I, yeah. In, in you're doing the climactic episodes, right? Mm-hmm. So how does that, in, first of all, you've got, you've seen what well, Sarah Well, I hadn't Nelson, really seen everything. So I saw Sarah's first episode. Right. They were in the process of cutting episode two. I had read the other episodes, but I think they were even still like finishing writing yours when I got. But you hired. knew what, you, you knew what happened. I knew what happened. I knew what happened. And I called every single one of these directors mm-hmm. and said, tell me everything. And um, I have to say like, I have found that sort of camaraderie to be invaluable to me and the honesty that other directors have with, with each other about, listen, here's what's really hard. Here's what's working great. Here's where you here's where you might struggle. To me, that is a game changer for how successful you can be on a, on a show. So in, in your episode, you're wrapping everything up. It's pretty emotional. You know, mm-hmm. A lot of reveals that wouldn't necessarily be something you'd see after you saw Sarah's first episode or even second. Uh, you know, it, it was in effect new territory, even if it was yeah. in the past. Yeah. And some of that was so tricky. Like, um, we had to sort of reimagine certain scenes, right? So, uh, Calvin gives Elizabeth a key in episode one, two, right. two. And in my episode, we go back and we realize that he actually bought a ring and he was going to give her a ring that day. But Sarah never knew that. Sarah didn't have it seen so that he was. I knew gonna, it. I just didn't. Not in my right. Episode, yeah. But, but it's like, it's not really in the cut. Like yeah. he pauses for a second and we're like, so I had to shoot the scene that pre came before that scene and have him putting the key or, you know, have him putting the ring somewhere. And then you think he's going to pull it out. So we're cutting back to Sarah's scene and recutting it. So there's more information coming. So there was a lot of that sort of toying with things or even, you know, Sarah shot the devastating scene where Calvin is killed, but I have to flash back to it in my episode. And so without going right back into it, because it was a more literal telling when Sarah did it, I was like, I have to be closer to him. And so it's literally like me on the ground with the leash and like (laughs) the the camera, right. And him going, this is ridiculous. And I'm like, trust me, it's going to look great. Um, so, so there were so many things where like I was getting more subjective than Sarah needed to get. And so, um, finding my way into that, um, was a lot of conversations with the DP and, and look, we had to build a, a whole new look for one of my episodes for a whole new world that we'd never seen, just like Nelson had to do. So yeah. in some ways it feels like an anthology that we all shot these very distinctive But places. it feels of a whole cloth to me. 
you know, again, as a viewer, having yeah, you know, well, that's a good thing for sure. Yeah, I, think so, I mean, yeah. I think we tried yeah. to. You try to carve out your own your own space within the sandbox that you're in. I think it speaks to our camaraderie as directors. I feel like we um, it was really important to me to uh, make sure everyone's like set up to feel super welcomed and to succeed and like to um, um, that you have the creative freedom to make your episodes your own, but that we're all making the same different chapters in the same movie. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think we all had such respect for each other. And what's well, yeah. kind of funny because I don't do it that often where I'm the executive producer of a series. And part is I don't like telling other directors to do anything. Mm -hmm. I'm very sensitive about creative rights and the creativity. And I don't know that I'm good at it. I mean, you obviously, you know, communicated in a way that was respectful and helpful. I always feel I, I sort of just shut up mm -hmm. and let let them do what they want, look at whatever they want, but it's I'm afraid. You know, what I mean, I, I feel a little uncomfortable. This story lent itself to um, a really good balance of both because it is. Um, at first blush, you think it's just going to be like, oh, it's like a story mm -hmm. of a lady with like workplace sexism and a, a romance, but it ends up being. Um, so much more than that and so much more complex than that as it goes on and the complexity is building. And so I think it, um, it had so much room for interpretation from each director for that I, I, reason. I think, I think you're right. It's just, it's interesting. Just th again, this is part of you know, what Sean was saying. And I, I, I really feel this. I love getting to know directors mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, I, I, I'm, we all, we all speak a similar language. We all face the same problem. We all look at the sun going down and have the same anxiety and it's just built into us. You know what I mean? So it's a very, you know, it's a very comfortable club as opposed to, again, you do something, I don't know that I can do it as well. It just makes me a, a little uncomfortable. Anyway, Sean, big question for you. Actors, how you approach this, you know, between that and the design, because you had a lot of big stuff to do and there was a lot of CG work there. And yet, to me, again, it feels so intimate. You know what I mean? In a story where you've got this big MacGuffin in the book, right? This diamond. And yet I felt like it was a small character based film with a couple of really critical characters. Well, that's that's good. I'm happy to hear that because, I mean, isn't it this? I, I always find like we have to play this trick on ourselves where you have the whole thing in your head and it feels big. But you know, my favorite thing about directing is maybe we have kids and maybe we have stresses and maybe we have like another nine things we have to do before the weekend. But I always feel like between action and cut, <laughs> my whole fucking world telescopes down yeah. Yeah. to that. And I love it. I love that the world is no bigger than this. And then I say cut and a bell rings and people come at you with 97 questions. But I really love the clarifying purity between action and cut. And, and between action and cut, doesn't matter what the backdrop is, doesn't matter that it's a Pulitzer important book. I mean, everyone here worked on a beloved book adaptation. That's daunting. It's intimidating. You don't want to screw it up. Um, and for me, the actors, and many of you have spoken about this, that moment to moment, do I believe this? Is it expressing something that feels important to me? Whether it's about redemptive connections or grace or hard truths or connection, all of which are at work in all of the work that I think we did in these projects. Um, so I just, I love just that the, the, the clarity of that and the actors are our vessel for that expression. And for me, I mean, I, this was a wonky one because you have, you had these two girls who had never done it before. You have Hugh Laurie who comes in ready and he's just delivering, just fucking automatic. Take one, take four, moving on next. Like just pro ready. And then you have Ruffalo, who is a pro, but is like learning how to act every take. And <laughs> um, and so it was quite amusing because I would watch Aria, who had never done it, with Hugh Laurie in the scene and Mark Ruffalo in the scene. And Aria is trying to figure out what is the job what is the expectation? How do I do it? And of course, what she eventually learned is 
There's no one way, just like there's no one way to direct. And you're going to cobble together your way from the influences of many. And uh, and so I just it was a fun gig because I had such a diverse range of modalities among the cast members. And that made every day interesting because it made every day different. Did you rehearse? Um, we did. I guess no. I guess the more I do this, me, I don't know. This is probably a very arguable position. I rehearse less and less the more things I make. I really don't want to burn it off camera. It, I it, want to hang out with the actors. I think you mentioned you make sure to connect with them. Um, and we'll do a table read and you'll learn a lot. And you might give a few thoughts of things you notice in table. Um, but no, I didn't. I just spent a lot of time with these rookies so that they could be comfortable in the language and the world they were coming into. What, what was your big anxiety about the working with sighted and unsighted actors going into it? Um, wow. Uh, my anxiety, as soon as I decided I wanted to cast people who were blind or low vision, I, re I just wanted to do right by them. And my anxiety is that I wouldn't. And some days I didn't. There were days where there's scenes where I would say, okay, so Aria here, the scene says you come in and you feel for the chair at the desk and you sit down. And she go, why don't I live here? Yeah. And don't I live alone? Yeah. Well, then why am I feeling for anything? I know where the chair is. It's where I left it. You just have seen people play blind with their hands in front of them. And so there were many moments like that where I would stumble into a revelation of my own ignorance. And I, I'm grateful Aria would just tell me. And uh, and so I just, I felt like the 50 different ways I could have messed this up. I had a real partner in this young woman to help make sure I didn't. Uh, I think that's really eloquent. And I, I would say for any directors who are out here or listen, uh, one of the things you're hearing is how much the directors listen and the better the director, in my experience, it's, you know, it's limited by the number of films you do and the number of directors you work with. If you're producing or your own experiences, the more comfortable you are at listening, the more you get and the more you create an environment to get things, whether you rehearse or not, however you approach it, it allows for, you know, what, what does the camera do? It records and it doesn't blink. So uh, it, it's just, a, you know, it's a very interesting thing, again, looking at it because of, of you know, what the reality was that you were doing it. Again, on this re relatively large canvas that gets bigger and bigger, and yet the end is pretty small, mm -hmm. right? You know, okay. Uh, boss woman. So how do you prepare? Do you do shot lists? Do you do yeah. storyboards? Yeah. Do you um, share them? Or you uh, storyboards, like storyboards? I don't do so much unless it's like something very large in scope, something VFX or something where someone could get hurt. And then I want everyone to be on the same page. So it's better to just plan it out and like show everyone the same thing. Um, storyboards, I definitely do. I, but I, I don't give mine out either, except to the DP and AD because. It's just a fallback plan. I get there and like everything changes when I'm in the room and in the space. And um, I do really thorough script analysis as my preparation, more so than any anything else is I like to keep things close until I've figured it out. So I don't give everyone the wrong. I wish there was some mechanism where we could do meetings later, like <laughs> when I know more things. Um, but you know, you call and say, I changed that. Um, but I really break down the script. I want to know in every scene, what is this about? What is the obstacle? What do they want? Where's the turning point in the scene? Like what's the transition in? What's the transition out? What are some subtext choices? Like I, I really want to know what it is. Um, because actors can sense when you don't. Oh yeah, yeah, and, they, <laughs> like they they do know, and yeah. and also like it's not. 
I feel like we come in with these plans sometimes and it's like, really, they have those programs and you move the people in the room and you do all that stuff. But like, I sometimes can tell watching episodes, like, I don't know if they knew what this was about. Mm -hmm. I sometimes think like, and, and it's, I can do it too. Like I can get really excited about a cool shot that like, sometimes isn't the right tool because it's it's just something cool but it's not really rooted in what is this scene about and it's not letting the scene tell you what things to do i, um, I have a phrase for that it, it's called trying to shoot the scene from the inside out yeah and it's pretty demanding and like sean was saying you know you don't always get there yeah you, know, you, you do the best you can you're professional you can do something people will look at it but you're sitting there and thinking they're yeah. really I do like rehearsals. We didn't get them like a rehearsal period yeah. because I was coming in and doing the back half of block. So all the right. characters had been built. Um, but what was your uh, mm -hmm. process with Riley? I, I met her once in casting and I thought she was really smart and had that a strong drive. She reminded me of when I met Halle Berry right before she went off and won her Oscar. And I went, this girl is going to fly. I mean, she just was pissed off about what happened in her life and she just wanted to go there. And I went, wow. And I, I felt similar when I met Riley and, and she's been doing some really interesting stuff. I love Riley. Huh. She's, she has been doing interesting stuff and she always chooses interesting <clears throat> things, which I love. Mm -hmm. She's a really spontaneous actor. Like she, she does try to save it for camera, which my rehearsals usually are like, just to get people out of the words for a second and into what the scene is about. So I'll just really improv it and not look for a perfect performance, but just so often I do that and I'll see actors like, Oh, mm -hmm. like they had a plan. And then we just like, forget the words. Let's just improv the scene and see what it's about. And that moment of recognition is like, okay, now we're going to have fun with the scene. Cause it's the, something in them has clicked. Um, and I do sometimes with showrunners, don't love mm -hmm. <laughs> some scenes i ask for a, a truly private rehearsal where you should ask like, for whatever you want nobody, you're the director yeah, nobody can be here for like just give me two passes with no one because what i know is actors sometimes won't they have something secret that's good but they're afraid to show it in front of everybody because it's a little different or might. And so when we get that private time where they don't feel like they're being watched, A, they feel like this person cares about me. They don't think I'm furniture to just be filmed. Like it's, this is just for me and it's not for the DP and it's not for the props guy. And it's not, it, this is just for me. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, rehearsal, script analysis, storyboards when it's, you know, somebody could break something, <laughs> all, all part of it. Cool. Sarah. Prep. Working with Brie and Prep, you get a double, a sandwich. Um, I um, I do shot list, and I do actually. I like everybody to have the shot list. Um, um, and it, it, sometimes things change, and that's fine. And then then we'll change them. But I I really I like to know even at the first like safety meeting, whenever possible, I kind of like to give people what the preview of the day is going to be. Um, what's the big shot we're going to try and achieve? Um, and how can we like sort of structure our day to make sure we're, um, giving time for that shot. And I, I try to be very, um, more and more as I, as I, I almost said like grow up, but I'm 41, but I guess, <laughs> but, um, as I, as I get more experience, I just try to be very, very economical. Um, and I think that's just because I have a very, I'm very, um, sensitive to, as we all are to, to rhythm and to cutting pattern and to be really specific about, um, what I'm shooting. So, um, trying my best, even on a TV schedule, not to like be like, okay, we're, you know, shooting coverage or whatever, but to just say like, what, how is the scene really want to live and how do we design our day so we can, um, um, achieve what sometimes shouldn't be achievable on a, on a TV schedule and make some choices now that maybe means less choices in the editing room, but, um, but really sort of, um, um, believe in those choices to support the, the cinema of the storytelling. Um, for, 
for that reason, sometimes I'm, um, you know, that's why I feel like I, I give my shot list ahead of time just cause I'm like, okay, today's ambitious. Let's, I want everybody on the same page cause we got to reach for the stars here. And this, we, I, I love to get, like, it really bothers me not to have a first shot off within the first hour of the day because I know like where I'm going the rest of the day. And I just want to make sure we've, um, we're all up and running. Um, working with Brie. Yeah. And I love, I loved working with Brie. Um, one thing that was like a great benefit to someone, you know, because I have a shooting style where sometimes I'm, you know, designing complicated shots. What was great is she, I really had her trust and she's a filmmaker too. So she gets it. So I could say like, Hey, I, I oftentimes will skip a rehearsal, which will sometimes drive, um, uh, the crew nuts, but I'll be like, so, Hey, so like, I'll, I'll tell her what's going on. But like, can I just do this with the stand-ins and then we'll light it and you're ready and then we'll do it. And she's like, yeah. So it, that was really nice rather than having to do the thing where, um, we're like, just, you know, some, some actors want to be more involved in that rehearsal and say like my character would never walk over here type of thing. And it was just really, I Brie gave me so much freedom as a filmmaker to be able to really, um, like plan that blocking ahead of time, nine times out of 10. Um, and, um, I think that she was, she's, um, she's incredibly, incredibly smart. She smells bullshit really quickly. I, I like that and respect that as well. And so I just made it really like honest and fun actually, like, um, just n no fucking around. Um, we're, we're just being, you know, as honest as possible with each other. We're always asking questions as deeply as possible. Um, and then she was always up for, um, anything. So, uh, she was up for any note and I felt like I could just um, um, push her in one way or another, and we would try things and experiment, um, and it was fantastic. Were you very active in the editing room and, and in the dub? I was. I was very... I, I like to be... Um, I will be there for as long as possible until I get kicked out, you know? And so I was lucky that in this one, they, they, we had such a trust. Um, and I, I could be, um, you know, part of the edit every step of the way, um, even through getting, um, you know, network notes and studio notes and all that stuff. So I, I felt like I could really, um, um, you know, deliver, um, what I had envisioned in, in a way that felt great. Cool. Milsa, editing post. What was your role? Oh. <laughs> uh, can I go back to the prep? You can do anything what? you want. Okay. So it's actually really interesting is because um, I have been directing for a while. and Oh, wait a second. Uh, 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 is that pulling it, back it, that zinger from before? Time as a director. But when I first started directing, I was really nervous about making sure that I had all the coverage and everything was great. And so I used to try to like, I had a storyboard program and I would try to storyboard everything. So I absolutely optimized my time and I made sure that I had every shot. And, you know, I mean, editing is uh, you shoot to edit. So you shoot the pieces of the ultimate puzzle that you have in your head. You have to deconstruct the puzzle and then you shoot all the pieces to then reconstruct it in post. Um, but, and so I wanted to make sure I had every piece because I, I didn't trust myself as a, as a director. And, and I always had mapped out like, you know, where the cast would go and I would shot list. And as I've become a more, uh, I think, confident director, I don't shot list at all anymore, which is very interesting. Um, I do diagrams. I take a diagram. I either draw my own diagram or I get the director's plans of the set or the location. And then I daydream. And I read the script over and over again, and I daydream from the character's perspective, like, well, where would I go if I was this character? And what does this mean? And what does this movement mean? And then once I kind of figure out, well, if I was the actor, I would probably go here. Then I daydream about, well, how is the best way to tell the point of view or what is the heart of the story visually with the camera? And I let my daydreams tell me this is what I want to do. And often I will go to my DP and my AD and I'll go... I have a thought <laughs> and it was a dream and they're like, what? And I was like, oh, okay, this is what we're going to try. And, and we go for it. And, um, I've also, in, in my experience, uh, really gained, um, I always respected actors, but I have a, a, a higher respect for what an actor brings and their participation in, telling the story, you know, it's not to tell them where to go and stand and how to say a line. It's, 
you know, as a director, I try to not give them those many notes, except for when I come up with like, hmm, this could be like even deeper. But I, I would never say like, at the end of this line, you smile. You know, um, to me, it's like, it's their job to embody and be the vessel of this character. And you hired them for a reason and how they interpret that character is so instrumental in making this character come to life and be three dimensional and that you cannot discount what their contribution is to it. So I always try to be present. I always try to hear what they have to say. And usually unless they ask, I will say like, well, I mean, obviously you start here, maybe you end up over there. Let me see what you feel. And most nine out of 10 times they do what I thought they would do because I've tried to be in their head, but you know, that one time that they don't, I try to understand why they made that choice and what that means to story and character and embrace that choice and really go, oh, I get it. And when we don't have an agreement on how something's to be played is to have, and this goes to speaking about Brie, is to have a conversation about it and say, well, why did you make that choice? And not to say, well, this is the way it's supposed to be done. It's and hear what they're saying for why they made that choice. And then sometimes when they make a choice, the effect of that choice is not what they intended it to be. So to be able to, as a director, say, okay, what you wanted is actually really valid. How it's coming across mm -hmm. is, is not happening. So let's figure out a way together to get that really important message through. So I found that's the best way that I prep and operate um, on set. And in post, um, I came, I too came out of music videos. I used to cut all my music videos. So, um, for a long time until it became nonlinear. And so I'm really, I'm like that director who can see like two frames. So sometimes I make editors insane and I have a photographic memory. So I memorize all of my footage and I know, and as soon as I'm done, I erase it and I go, I don't remember anything, but, um, and I remember everything. I remember each take. I remember when they like turn their head this way on a busted take. And it's important to me that an editor look through every, especially now when you do stuff on video, you need to look through every take and look through every piece of material and check it all because it's our job to pull out all of the best performances and then look for all of the nuances and things that we can add and build and create just through the juxtapositions of shots and, and creating a mood and a vibe. And so I really look for that when I go into post. And it's also great when you have a wonderful editor. I had a really great one. Um, but to see, you know, how your editor puts your material together without you like telling them that when you look at the editor's cut, it's like so amazing because you go, huh. Sometimes they totally get exactly what you were thinking. And then other times they do something totally different. And you're like, but that, that really does work. And, and to really, you know, look in and, and always try to see like, yeah, it's your footage and it might not be put together in the way that you originally imagined, but does that make the story and character stronger? And if it does, that's what you go with. Yeah. Um, Post. Yeah, yeah. so I was going to say, um, I also had two wonderful editors on this uh, on this show, and I was in the edit for extra days for whatever reason. I think, again, just because we got the scripts, or I got my scripts so late, and they were sort of, um, there was a lot of voiceover in Seven, and we were rewriting that voiceover even in the edit room, and um, we were really rebuilding like quite a bit of stuff when, when I was going. And I feel very lucky that um, our showrunner, Lee Eisenberg, who obviously is uh, a wonderful creative collaborator, um, that he was willing to give me that space and, and, and really wanted me to finish the vision and, and was, you know, grateful that I was willing <laughs> to like take it that far. Um, you know, I think the, the editing process is like the last stage of writing. It's like first it's written on the page and then you're rewriting on set and then you're rewriting it in the edit room. And I certainly found that on these episodes, um, um, tonally, um, making sure that it never felt too treacly. Um, that was a huge thing for me. It was like, you had this story about this woman and it was just so easy for everyone to dismiss it as some sort of like chick lit story. And humanizing our characters, never, um, over sentimentalizing. Um, I fought for that in terms of the music that we were picking, finding, finding the right tone for everything. And, and I feel really lucky that I got again, like to stay involved in that process long after most 
episodic directors would that they were sending me cuts and the editors were like sneakily telling me what everybody was thinking and asking my opinion on sequences. Um, especially I think in my episodes in particular, there's so much, um, intercutting Rosemary DeWitt does like a nine minute monologue and we flash back to like, you know, a whole lifetime of events. Um, um, and then Brie, you know, when she's quitting the show, we're intercutting between her on stage quitting and something that happened previously where she called the head of the network and told him how it was going to go down and, um, planning that so that it would cut well was very, very tricky. Um, and to Brie's credit to go back to working with actors, she's a ninja. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I have 15 shots that I have to cut to in this scene. I want to shoot it in like four setups. Mm -hmm. So how can, like, can you help me mm -hmm. so that you have like eight pages of dialogue? I come to you in this room for this line, this line, mm -hmm. this line, this line. And I don't want to just shoot you sitting. So let's make it matter. Let's have you move. Let's figure out when do you slam down that phone, you know? So, so the editing process was happening in my head way before I ever got to the editing room. And I certainly had long conversations with the editors so that they would know what was coming their way. Um, and that's another thing I do, I think, is um, just make sure that, I mean, I have it so cut in my head. Um, Are you I, surprised by the editor's work at times? Um, in a positive or negative way? I would say in a positive way. Like, it's always wonderful to see when they've uh, understood what you were doing. Like, that's the best thing. Or when an editor calls and says, I'm really excited about your footage. <laughs> like, I find that to be such like a badge of honor when they're excited to cut what you've done. Well, you um, get to be my age. Anytime somebody gives you a compliment, you get I mean, suspect. You take it. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take it. What's wrong? Uh, all right, one last question. Uh, Sean, uh, music. You had a, like a young composer there to work with, right? Yeah, I luck I I was meeting composers and I got a call from an agent saying James Newton Howard wants to talk to you. And so I got on the phone with him and he's like, I want this gig. Please give me and and I was like, Do you know you're James Newton Howard? Why are you hustling for this gig so hard? <laughs> like, bro, you've written 70 movie scores. <laughs> um and he said, I just I love the book, I love these scripts. I've wanted to work with you. I, I will I will do 20 sketches of a cue until you love it. And like, can I please? And he came at it hard. And and I remember saying, so you're you're I'm getting a veteran pro with the hunger of a rookie. That's like there's nothing better. There's nothing better. Um and so I got James Newton Howard and he wrote he wrote a score for this four episode limited series that is as beautiful as anything I've heard in any movie in a lot of years. And um, he is such an elegant gentleman, but with such passion to to do right by the material and the scene and moment to moment. So um, I was just very, very lucky. Um, it, and I love his work on this. It's a really memorable I mean, again, coming at it from the outside, I just thought it was just beautiful, beautiful work. And, you know, uh, I'm involved with the American Film Institute, so we put on the Life Achievement Award. So one year we did John Williams. Mm -hmm. So in doing it, we would see Spielberg's E.T. without the music. You'd see Raiders of the Lost Ark without the music, and you'd go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, what's this bicycle doing riding like this, you know? You know, none of the lyricism, and it's just it's the je ne sais quoi of often of, of some pieces. And I thought in your film, it's I mean, it's it's so transformative. But you know what else comes to mind? I mean, someone was saying, um, I, I think when you're starting out, you think that you need to control everything, and that that's being a leader, controlling everything. And then you do it a little bit, and I saw this. In James, I saw it. I see it in my own evolution. I think several people have spoken about this. It's like, no, no. Being a leader is you're surrounded by all these talented people. Just, man, shut up sometimes. Take great ideas. Guess what? We still get to be the director and we get all these talented partners' ideas and their passion. That's how I felt with James Newton Howard. And it's how he himself works. 
is he doesn't read his own IMDb list. He yeah. just shows up, watches the scene, wants to make it more beautiful and expressive. And if he's doing that at that stage of his career, I found that incredibly inspiring to do it in mine. It's uh, anyway, it was, it was wonderful work. I've I've had the good fortune to work with Thomas Newman for many, many, many movies I directed. He's fantastic. And one of the things we all know is, you know, actors have a tremendous amount of vulnerability, right? And on some level, we're all very protective of them and need to be, right? And same thing is true with composers. You know, when Tom has to play something for me, I think, oh my God, he doesn't, if I don't like it, no matter what I do, he's going to read it. And it's like, he's so good. How can I not like it? But, you know, you have to do, you have to make the choice, right? Uh, but that alchemy, again, and and the listening, and also it's something it was touched on here, which is when you have the trust of the actor or the actress, you know, it's unbelievable what you can say. I mean, you can just be so brutally honest if it's in the service of love and getting to the next thing. And they love it. They thrive on it because their great terror is you didn't see that they were faking it. And once they know that you're not, okay, we'll go to the end of the world. So this is going to be the end of this evening. Unfortunately, I've enjoyed it enormously. I hope you have. Thank you. And I just, I just want to say not only thank you for, for recognizing them, but what wonderful work. It's, as I said, it's such a pleasure to get to know directors and, and, and the acclaim of your peers. This is a really big deal. You know what I mean? It's not, you can't walk away from this and pretend this is a big deal and it's so deserved. And I just hope that the resonance of your work is something that resonates for you. So you do much, much more. So thank you and congratulations, everybody. Thank you.